Uh, so uh, welcome everybody to today's edition of our webinar Emerging Topics in Biomolecular Magnetic Resonance. Um, yeah, uh, for those who haven't been here, I mean, please don't record because uh, upon the speaker's consent, we do record and then uh, Kevin Gardner loads up the recorded lectures to the ICMRBS YouTube channel. So um, uh, also to remind you, use the Q&A and not the chat uh, function for asking questions and you're encouraged to place your questions already during the presentation. Uh, you can also raise your hand and we can unmute you uh, such that you can uh, directly have a discussion with the speaker. Uh, and uh, this is a reminder for the early career researcher uh, webinar of the ISAM RPS, uh, which I think is a fantastic uh, uh, webinar. So it's a pleasure to introduce Ulrich Günther, our um, second speaker. And um, uh, he is now um, a professor at the University of, of Lübeck. He moved there just a few weeks ago, I guess, or uh, maybe a couple of months ago. Um, so let me introduce him to you. He graduated from the University of Lübeck, uh, where he did his PhD under the supervision of Klaus Albert on localization methods for um, 19F in vivo NMR spectroscopy. Uh, then he did a, a, a four-year um, uh, postdoc um, um, at the Tufts School of Medicine with William Batschufchin and later Brian Schaffhausen, uh, first focusing on small molecule structures and then later on protein ligand interactions, which also he continued then um, doing very, very diligently during his habilitation with Heinz Rüterjans uh, um, in Frankfurt, where he uh, um, really pushed forward line shape analysis to derive kinetic mechanisms of protein ligand binding. And um, uh, in this work also Tanya Mittag, who was a speaker before, uh, was involved, uh, who uh, graduated from, uh, from his group. Um, then uh, in 2004, he moved to uh, the University of Birmingham, where he um, uh, built uh, the um, um, high field uh, NMR facility there, um, which also then, um, um, not the least by his interference, uh, became one of the European um, infrastructures. He hold, held a chair of biophysical chemistry there since 2010. Uh, he he uh, um, also because of I think funding restraints in the, in the UK was involved in a huge number of European um, projects. Uh, it's too many to, to read them um, to you. Uh, but um, be, he became very much interested in um, metabolomics, uh, which is also um, now really the, the, the great field that he's uh, working on and will continue working on also at the University of Lübeck. So please, the floor is yours, Ulrich. Okay, first, thank you for the extremely kind uh, introduction. Yes, I spent 15 years in England and I liked England. Now I'm back to Germany and going from a really large facility. I'm now at a relatively small university and small lab. Um, and I, I wasn't sure what to present here because I spent many years um, developing um, flux methods by NMR. Yeah. In the turn of doing this, I discovered that it was really Bob Schulman who started it and Kurt Wüthrich did it for a few years and then it became all mass back. Um, I decided to pick here the um, most recent metabolomics topic and if I have three minutes left in the end, I'll show you a few results of fluxes that I've, fl fluxes by NMR that I have done. Um, the reason why I picked the metabolomics is uh, of, of SARS-CoV-2 is because it's very timely. The papers, um, been submitted a few weeks ago and it's ongoing work and we're all affected by the pandemic. Um, if you do metabolomics you can do that at, at many different levels. Yeah, um, They used to just fingerprint without knowing what it means and then went more into um, quantitative methods. Now if we do metabolomics um, and you have one of these Bruegger IVDR spectrometers, they integrate most of your peaks and throw out a list of integrated peaks, which you have to curate afterwards. And we did a lot of checks to make sure that what we get is correct. But largely what Bruegger supplies with these instruments is actually quite solid. And um, what you get in such a metabolomic spectrum? Well, it's actually a, a, a wild um, signature that you um, see there and you see a lot of large thick peaks. 
And I knew for a long time that um, you can get some lipoproteins in these uh, in the mass spectra, but I wasn't really familiar with this in detail. It happens to be that um, the lipoprotein cholesterol analysis is the only uh, clinically approved metabolomics method uh, in the world, and that was developed by James Otvos. Um, and that's um, FDA approved in the US. And, and there's a company that runs lots of those. Um, there's also a company in Germany that does this. I don't know how successful they really are. And um, a third one by um, um, Ala Kopela in Finland. Um, so it turns out that these large blobs of peaks carry a lot of information and you see parts of these um, large lipoproteins. So large lipoproteins means um, these are um, large aggregated structures um, that contain lipids and that also contain um, phospholipids, triglycerides, cholesterols and cholesterol esters along with apolipoproteins. And these can be quantified, yeah? This, I haven't developed this. This has been developed first by Otfos and then by several groups. Um, this here, so the first in Germany was actually um, the first paper in Germany that has this has Robert Kalbitz as the NMI expert on it. So he has been involved in this. And for a long time, I personally didn't take this whole thing very serious. Yeah. It turns out that these um, particles, so there's, there's this rule of thumb, the HDL cholesterol, H for healthy, and um, um, VDL cholesterol is the unhealthy one. So your cholesterol has to be in the right compartment. Otherwise, uh, you get these cholesterol um, related um, um, diseases, usually heart disease. And, in, and, and these um, lipoproteins happen to be good markers for heart disease. There are a lot of papers about this. For a long time, it wasn't so clear to me how useful this actually um, is. It turns out you can fit a lot of lines into these multiplets. So here you see, for example, the CH2s, you see, you see the CH3s, you can see, separately see the CH2s if there's a, is one double bond um, next to it. And if there are two double bonds, you have a, again a different thing. They all have different chemical shifts. And what people have done is they fit a lot of Laurentian lines into these peaks and different approaches also take, um, analytical methods like ultracentrifugation to separate these lipoproteins, get the individual spectra and then put it together again. One other approach, and, and we have started to do that quite successfully, is to use um, dosi spectra and separate those in blood directly with dosi because the size of these particles um, varies significantly and you can separate them nicely on regular probes. Um, in addition to this comes a signature of um, um, glycoproteins, and that comes out in the most recent paper about um, COVID signatures by Jeremy Nichols, and that just came out a few days ago, um, where he shows that glycoproteins add to a lipoprotein signature um, and seem to be very good markers for inflammation. That's not in the proper analysis, and the reason for that is simply that there's a patent. Um, it happens to be that this field of NMR that at least I wasn't too familiar with um, has a big community following it and it seems to be very relevant for actual uh, medical applications. Um, you record very simple 1D spectra. The other spectra you can do is as I said is doses. People use CPMGs to filter in the other direction, or you can actually do a diffusion filtered spectrum. Um, Claudio has done that a long time ago, and then you see just the broad component. So the methods you use to select different features of these spectra are all well known to the NMR community and have not been developed in this context, but they are very useful and they actually provide interesting medical information. There have been three recent papers in that field. The first by uh, Jeremy Nicholson, who used a combined NMR um, mass spec approach. And he saw that these um, lipoproteins change. And the second one is by Oscar Millet, whose face I see 
um, right across the screen here. Um, he published his analysis um, shortly before Christmas, I would say, and then there's a new paper in analytical chemistry that I've just mentioned by Jeremy Nicholson very recently. And we in um, Lübeck um, started a collection of um, samples from two different groups. Now, I got one thing wrong here. There's one slide out of order. I um, don't know what I did with that. Um, we had two different uh, cohorts that we looked at, and these are um, shown here. First, we had COVID patients, and it's almost embarrassing. It was five patients when we submitted the paper. Now we have about 10. The number of patients up here were not very large. Now we also got another lot of 10, 15 um, from Kiel. The problem with getting these samples is that either they don't have patients or when they do have patients, they have so many that they don't find the time to collect the samples and um, get them into the hands of people like us. They, they don't think of the NMR spectroscopists being interested in that. But there was an ongoing study um, of patients with cardiogenic shock. Um, these were ICU patients, intensive care unit patients, both of them, and that gave us a way to compare. And what made this slightly more interesting is that of each of these patients, we had longitudinal samples over two weeks, two samples per day, so that we had an ongoing sample collection that gave us a good statistical um, basis to do a, an analysis. And then there is a second study on campus here that was started by um, Christine Klein, who I saw also collaborated with uh, Christian Griesinger in other means. And she started to collect, um, started to co basically a collection of samples from um, healthy and infected individuals across the Lübeck area with an app where people can register to get a free test. Um, but they must not have had a severe COVID infection. And among this co cohort of 3,000, there are now um, around 50 who are um, COVID positive, um, who have not been seriously ill, and we have the blood of those as well. And for those, we have the IgG titus. Yeah, so this is the um, fast test that tells you whether your blood is COVID positive. And we had two titers, one against the um, spike protein and the other one against the um, capsid protein. Um, first, if you look at the spectra of these um, groups and you compare the COVIDs with the healthy, so the COVIDs are the red ones and the healthy are the green ones. You see on the first shot, if you look at these uh, lipoprotein signatures and to the left, you have the larger ones that the COVIDs have a lot more VLDL, also more LDL, whereas the healthy controls have more HDL, the healthy form of it. And you also see changes in phenyl phenylalanine and you could do the same with these glycoproteins and you would also see that the peaks um, um, change. Um, in addition, if we compare the cardiogenic shock, um, we see that there's some overlap, but there's also a separation uh, to some degree with, between them. So on the left, what you see is a principal component analysis that we did on the whole spectra. So these were a few hundred spectra. We aligned the spectra as Nicholson has developed over the past 15, 20 years. And um, we basically get this nice um, um, principal component analysis if we do this comparison. So that looked rather promising and it confirmed the studies that had just come out, of course. And if we do a pairwise comparison, you see um, um, very nicely that the, the healthies and the COVIDs separate and the COVID and the cardiogenic shock against each other separate as well. We've also looked at time causes. And if you look at time causes here, for example, for, for patient 17, there was an individual, he, he was a, a pediatrician, he was 53 years old and he died in the end. Um, and you see that his signature goes very extreme. And then we had other signatures of patients who were in the hospital for a short time and they basically stay somewhere in the middle and only circle a little bit, yeah. So I'm, this is again the patient who passed away with a significant change over the time of the hospital stay. And this 
oops, and this small one here is actually a patient who stayed for a short time. These are several arrows and they're hard to see, but the, the samples stay within a small cluster here. Um, now that shows very clearly that the method is actually um, feasible to distinguish controls from healthies, which is in a sense, relatively boring. We also did what they call um, PLSDA. So this is a supervised method where you tell the algorithm which is COVID and which is healthy controls. And then you develop a so-called area under the receiver operator curve that tells you how significant your signature is. And with when this um, shows high sensitivity for low specificity and vice versa, you have a signature that is um, medically irrelevant. And for the separation, actually, we are 100%. And for the separation between COVID and cardiogenic shock, we are in the high 90%, 99% area. So between all these groups, we have uh, interesting, significant separation. Um, I should say, in addition, that the cardiogenic shocks, um, they had an average BMI of 26, and the COVID-19s had an average BMI of 29. I say this because one of the reviewers came up with it. And the critical question that came from that from the same review was, how do you know what is chicken and egg? Yeah. So we think we can, in part, sort out the chicken and egg by comparing um, COVID against cardiogenic shocks. So the chicken and egg problem really is, is this a signature that leads to COVID or is this a signature that arises from COVID? And I don't know what Oscar thinks, but I, th I think we can't completely answer the question. Nicholson's most recent paper makes some effort to do that. And we do make an effort by comparing um, different intensive care patients with similar BMI, but we can't clearly say what it is. So now we have an ongoing study in a geriatric hospital where we take samples from um, um, patients who are there for three, four weeks with post-COVID syndrome, and we compare those to similarly aged um, um, patients. But there we don't have results yet. So as is customary in the field, we have done a, a cluster analysis of these uh, metabolites. And you, you see here the clusters in different colors. Of course, you can't read those. Um, but you can see, except for one group, um, the COVID versus healthy controls and the COVID versus cardiogenic shock show actually similar markers. They are just more pronounced for the COVID patients. Yeah, that leaves the question: Is it a consequence? Is the signature a consequence of COVID, or is it a, a, a precursor to get the disease? Um, here, are somewhat larger, and you see here is a group that that is a bit more separated. You can see this much better in in these so-called forest plots, and this is something um, that people start to use in this field. And if you look at the metabolites. The probably strongest effect is that the glutamine glutamate ratio is low in all these patients. Um, there are issues like the, the glucose is always high, but that doesn't mean anything, but that they were had an infusion with glucose on it. Um, at the same time, if you look, for example, at cholesterol, there's a group in the VLDLs, and these are the bad ones, that is high in the COVID, and the same is true for the free cholesterol, yeah? On, and on the same, uh, at the same time, the LDL cholesterols are relatively low, and so are the, the HDL cholesterols, the healthy ones, are considerably lowered compared to the normals. So the line in the in the middle is the healthy controls, yeah? And the, um, um, the, the dots show you how it's increased or lowered compared to the controls. The triglyceride of a certain group, and that includes the VLDLs and LDLs, are, are particularly high in these um, COVID patients. And if you look at the lipoprotein particles, there's always the ARPOB100 to ARPOA1. That's one of these proteins that is actually associated with these um, large um, supramolecular molecules is always relatively high. Um, another part of the signature is the phospholipids. They are high in the VLDL compartment and very consistently between all studies I have seen, it's the LDL triglycerides that are high. They're also high in my blood, by the way. Um, and in addition, there are the apolipoproteins. The apolipoprotein A and B is always lowered, but the um, 
the LTL1 RPOB is always very high. That is a fairly consistent signature that you see. And I'm going to show this first because Oscar is in the audience. He did a similar study with slightly larger number of patients and he actually sees a very very similar signature there yeah it's not exactly the same but it is actually reassuring that the signature that we see between three sites in in perth and i think nicholson also had samples from cambridge and in uh, i was going to see birmingham but it's lubeck now and in Madrid, these are very, very similar signatures. And if you then compare the COVIDs against the cardiogenic patients, you see basically, um, so in red one is this comparison. And for, the, for this comparison, the middle line is no longer the healthy controls, but rather the... Um, but rather the COVID patients, you see it's particularly here for the triglycerides where the um, cardiac patients have larger values um, than the um, COVID patients, except for this, there's nothing higher in these um, bad um, lipoproteins in cardiogenic shock patients. But the difference in the signature is sufficient to distinguish them uh, this distinguish the cardiogenic shocks from the COVID patients. Um, if you look at the time courses, and I got the slide only yesterday um, for the different particles, you basically see if you look for these particles, and the gray one here is, is COVID-19, and that's the case for all of them, over the time of the stay, and the reason why it's always 14 days is that the ethics set the 14 days, so the patient who, who died lived in another week, but we don't have samples for the last week. Um, you see that these, um, basically these signatures increase over the time, which is also something that tells me this is an effect that arises from COVID and is not just a precondition. Um, then we looked at the second group and the second group, as I just said, are, um, are people from the general population in the area of Lübeck who threw an up registered for a free test and they come for free tests now over um, um, four months and I think it stops after six months. Um, so we have a longitudinal um, study of people who are just normal without disease and people who have had very relatively minor symptoms um, and we wanted to see whether we see the same signature. Yeah. Um, if you do the PCA on those healthy controls versus um, uh, the um, COVID, no, it's not COVID patients versus the cough SARS-2 positive individuals, you see more or less no separation. If you do the PLSDA, well, you can separate everything with the PLSDA, but if you look at the receive overrider curve, it's flat, and that means there is no significant separation between those. So we wondered whether this data is of any significance. So what we did is we built correlation plots of different, of, of all the metabolites against the two titers, the anti-spike um, protein titer and the anti um, capsid protein. So CP stands for capsid protein titer. And when you do this, um, you see that you get, for example, a nice correlation down here between the two titers. This is kind of what I would have expected. Yeah. Um, you also get a massive correlation with glycine. And we can't explain that. All the patients who are SARS-CoV-2 positive develop high, level of high levels of glycine. Jeremy Nicholson then in a, in a meeting that we had in an international COVID forum said, can you spike it? We spiked it and it's very clearly glycine in the blood. Glycine is not known as a biomarker for any disease, but there are reports that immune responses can cause large levels of glycine. And all the other lipoproteins that we see here are essentially anti-correlated with this figure. Yeah. So this is quite interesting because in the COVID positives, we saw LDL and VLDL positively correlated. And here see, we see mainly the ADL particles anti-correlated. And if you look at those um, in, um, in, in plots here, also doing some statistics, you see, see that very clearly. You see the glycine goes up with the others or the others go down. In most of the markers um, for um, serum positivity without disease, um, 
are different to those uh, which uh, uh, to those patients who were actually developing disease with the exception of HDL4 cholesterol and that actually goes in the same direction so i think what we see in these signatures is an ongoing worsening of a bad lipoprotein signature and that is actually perfectly in line with the fact that these people develop some kind of um, arther arterial uh, um, defects where lipoproteins um, precipitate um, in, in veins and in, in, in arteries and cause these effects in the lungs, in the brain. And I personally believe if we look, look longer, what we see is that these effects largely arise from these um, lipoprotein signatures. So the question is whether I have three or four minutes left, and then I will show you another topic. First, I want here I want to thank everybody who was involved in this. Um, these were the students, and these were the supervisors, and then there's a large number of people who collected all these 3,000 samples over the past weeks. Do, do I have a minute left, or should I finish? Yeah? Continue, please. It's, it's not a problem. Yeah. Okay, it's not a problem. Okay, the, so what I did before in Birmingham, and at the moment this rests, but we're writing publications, and I still have um, two students in Birmingham, but this is, is dying out now, um, is um, tracer-based metabolomics and fluxomics. And there we basically looked in cancer cells, what we can do um, with um, fluxes in cells. So basically what we did is we see 13 labeled cells and we used many different labels going from um, um, glutamine, glucose, um, serine, um, branch chain amino acids. And there's a different story to be told for um, different uh, labeling strategies we have done. The one I picked out here is one that is submitted, which I think is particularly interesting. So in this slide, you basically see what gets labeled from what, and some of these are expected. So for example, if you label glucose, you can see serine and, and glycine labeled, but there are actually cancers that can't do this, cancers that depend on serine uptake. And that is you, something you can show very nicely with um, um, labeling strategies. Another one we did is um, branch chain amino acids. Branch chain um, amino acids go very, very high in myeloma. And the reason for that is that myeloma depend on um, huge amounts of um, essential amino acids because um, they produce shed loads of light proteins. And that's what many, what many pa patients actually die of. These light proteins clog up the kidneys and other organs. And... Um, to produce these light proteins for, for the protein synthesis, the precursors are needed. So these are all things we did with um, uh, labeling strategies. So here is an example of a topic um, that I found was particularly interesting. So we used stromal cells and we put these stromal cells in contact with um, with acute myeloid leukemia cells. That is a topic that came in an EU project and we were mainly interested to see whether metabolism in acute myeloid leukemia cells changes in the contact with other cells. So these experiments are actually quite complicated because you have to find a way um, to bring the cells into contact and at the later stage, separate them again, that you actually know that your metabolites come from the cells that you're interested in. And the student who did the work figured out how to do this. Now, it happens to be that if you feed these um, cells different precursors, you can see very nicely where the labels go. And it turns out that if you use one, two glucose, um, one, two labeled glucose, you can figure out different entries into the Krebs cycle. If you use glutamine, acetate, you can see very nicely where these labels end up in energy metabolism. So the experiment we did here is we had our AML cells in suspension. We had MS5 cells. So this is a stromal cell that seems to support AML cells and we did co-cultures. And 
we see also a number of changes in these um, co-culture cells. Yeah, you can see one peak here that's particularly large, and that's the largest effect that we focused on. That is, these cells produce jet loads of acetate, and this acetate is secreted into the um, in, into the growth solution. Um, it's also taken up by the AML cells, and as you can imagine, cells. Us cells would usually use glucose. Glucose is um, metabolized into pyruvate and pyruvate goes into the Krebs cycle, but equally you can also feed acetate in the Krebs cycle. So we used labeled acetate to prove that it's actually taken up and that it is um, uh, metabolized. It goes into acetylcarnitine, but then it also goes, so probably into lipid synthesis from that. Um, and from this, it goes into basically everything you can dream of in the Krebs cycle. Now, there's a lot of work that we have done in this to figure out, and mainly by NMR, where metabolites come from and where they go. And the outcome of this study is the MS5 cells, they can import acetate, but they can't metabolize it. The SKM well, this is the AML, this is the cancer cells, they consume and use acetate, and they can flux their Krebs cycle with it. Um, the question now is um, how this affects metabolism. Now I'm showing this slide here because it shows very nicely what you can do with labeling. In co-culture, the entry into the Krebs cycle becomes a different one. Why can we see that? Um, if you have entry of pyruvate through pyruvase car pyruvate carboxylate, you get the 2 3 labeled of aspartate labeled. And in aspartate malate, the 2 and 3 positions aren't equivalent, whereas in fumarate, they are. And then the coupling constant between 3, 4, and 1, T, 2, because you have a carboxyl, carboxylic acid group in the end, is larger than the 2, 3. So you get coupling patterns if you acquire HSQCs with higher resolution, where you can then see that the um, 1, 2, 3, 4 product is higher in co-culture. So the entry into the Krebs cycle changes. But the most significant effect actually is that these cells produce that these stromal cells produce acetate. The way they do this is very clearly through a chemical conversion. If you use pyruvate and you pour hydrox, hydro, um, peroxide on it, H2O2 on it, um, what you get is acetate. This is similar alpha keto carboxylic acid decarboxylation. Um, you also get some PC um, activity, which I've just shown. Now this acetate, um, produced through ROS, and when biologists talk about ROS, they actually mean peroxides, um, is transferred, um, the ROS is transferred from the cancer cells into the stromal cells. So basically this lets the cancer cells grow better when they get rid of the ROS, um, because this would eventually kill the cancer cells. Um, and from this, the acetate is fed back into the cancer cells, um, to drive their grab cycle and to further improve their survival. So I found that was a very nice story where we used um, uh, NMR fluxes to figure out a mechanism um, of uh, cell interaction that would actually been, have been very hard to figure out otherwise. Um, and this work was done by uh, Nuria Villaplana and the collaborator there, is, and she's not on the picture, is um, Paloma Garcia. Lots of Spanish people there. Okay, thank you very much um, and uh, for, for, for uh, discussing these two projects uh, and, and, and both are, of course, very interesting for, for the health. So um, I, I read some questions that came in already from the audience. The first one is by Igor Dickey. Hi Ulrich, can talk for the PCAs? Was the data scaled and centered beforehand? Yeah, it was scaled and scanned and we also did a variant scaling. Um, we did this both for the, you have to do this if you take the, the broker data, otherwise the PCA comes out very silly. You have to do that, yes. Okay, um, then the, an anonymous um, attendee, very interesting talk in order to resolve the chicken egg conundrum, would it make sense to have two groups of mice inject one with COVID and monitor them in this way? Can the metabolism signatures be compared with humans? Hmm, 
I mean, that is a very big question, yeah? And you have to ask a virologist. Now, I have talked to virologists to figure out what the mechanism be be behind this is, but they're all very busy with other things at the moment. And there are basically only three labs in Germany that would be allowed to um, work um, with COVID. So it's not so easy to find somebody who can do this experiment, yeah? Are there actually mouse models for COVID? Well, that's the other question. Is there a mouse model? And I'm, I'm not aware that you can do this on mice. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, maybe the anonymous attendee asks, uh, follows up on his question, or his or her question. Then uh, Rolf Buhlens, hi Ulrich, the VDL signatures in COVID patients were between, were between different patients. Is the high VDL mm -hmm. at a priori of the patients? So is, is the high, uh, are they all probably in bad condition already? Or did the patient get worse with COVID? I guess it got worse, the patient got worse. Right? Well, from the time causes, we can now say they do get worse, yeah? But whether they had a signature like that in the beginning that just gets worse, we don't know. What mm. we would need is a COVID patient with a sample before the person caught COVID. Mm. But that you don't get, yeah? Yeah. That's, that's really the problem, yeah, because if, if this is a signature for um, severity, then it is actually useful as a signature to sort out patients with post-COVID syndrome. And that's what we're trying at the moment, yeah. I mean, um, I, I could not finish reading his full question, but have there also been studies on single patients where they are followed in time? Well, we did, we did that. And, and the time courses I showed briefly is exactly that. Yeah. Mm, okay. But basically we had four, now it is nine patients who we followed in time. But for those, oh. we do actually see increases, but it's not going from zero to a hundred. It is just increasing. Then um, another or the same anonymous um, attendee, the altera alteration in gl uh, uh, glutamine level patient versus healthy might be interesting. Is this alteration in glut glutamine level an indication of altered activation perhaps of mTOR signaling? Is that possible? No, I think it, I think it is simply liver damage. If yeah. you get liver damage, you release ALT, alanine transaminase, yeah? And that changes your glutamine glutamate ratio. So you basically release alanine transaminase into the blood. And this is how you diagnose liver damage. You just take the alanine transaminase level. So in a sense, this marker is just a surrogate marker of alanine transaminase in the blood. I completely agree. Uh, that, that's exactly what we saw. And uh, it would be mitochondrial impairment in the liver. And also mm -hmm. explains the, the release of ketone bodies that we, that we also saw in there. Yeah, that, that's what you would expect. Yeah. We didn't see these as much. I know, I know. But, uh, but, but we saw them, I think Jeremy did as well. I mean, I, I guess it depends on the patients. But, but I, I, in the end, it's, it's just another consequence of what you just said. Um, so the, I think there's a reaction from the animal anonymous attendee saying that there are what mustelids, including ferrets, are used as models for the infections. Uh, probably ferrets. I mean, yes, uh, they were killed mm. large numbers in Denmark. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I want to do that. I'm looking for somebody mm. who can do this. So, yeah. I mean, he, he, here in Lübeck, they are actually building a 3B lab and they have somebody working on noroviruses. Um, that is a possibility that somebody starts to pick up on, on COVID when they are allowed to do that. Otherwise, you have to go to Greifswald. There is an island where they do these. Um, but um, it, it's basically the people who are in the media all the time now who you have to collaborate with. Yeah. Mm. So the, the, the last question I see at the moment is uh, from Lu Yun Lian. Thanks, Ulrich. Do you need a special software to analyze the flux spectra as they can be quite complicated? Yeah, they, we build the software. So basically we built, this was done with different methods. We built ourselves a filtered 1D spectrum that is relatively invariant towards the large um, variations of uh, CH coupling constants. 
um, in metabolites, it's not one fixed coupling constant. You really would have to, and you don't know the coupling constants. Otherwise, you could trans calculate the transfer function in HSQCs. So we used um, a double G bird kind of construct that gave us in a different spectrum good um, label incorporations. The other thing we did is we used HSQCs, and this is more tricky. And for the HSQCs, we basically built a software with which you can assign and integrate them. Um, and, and we curated the HMDB library of chemical shifts, some of which are quite wrong for, H for C13 HSQCs into the software. You can get that from Christian Ludwig in, in Birmingham. And he also developed software where he fits these multiplets, um, these C13, C13 multiplets, because then of course you get exactly the label incorporation of adjacent positions and, and, and we can mix that with GCMS. And so there is a lot of software, but as I only put these few slides in the end, I did not dwell into the software developments that were done in that, um, in that course. There's another question by Grace Royapa. Have you compared with high cholesterol patients the COVID data? Nope. And that's that's the obvious question to ask. Yeah, um, we have not. And 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 high cholesterol, diabetes, high BMI were excluded from Christine Klein's ELISA study on healthy individuals. Yeah, so we can't get any of those. But we we have actually we actually had somebody start this week with a PhD, a doctor in a geriatric hospital, and she will do exactly that: pick out patients with post-COVID syndrome and no post-COVID who have high cholesterol, so that we can answer this question. Okay, may, 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 maybe I can ask a question um, as well. So you, you had sometimes these uh, PCA plots where, um, where, where different cohorts were compared and sometimes they were overlapping and sometimes they were not. Were yeah. different principal components or what? So in principal component analysis, you have some overlap between the um, the COVIDs and the cardiogenic shocks, but if yeah. you do a PLSDA, you can separate them. So the statistical methods to tell them apart are there, and they are significantly different. And uh, I'm, I'm not such a statistics um, well. I, I'm, I'm just not trained so well. So, so what's the difference between these two methods? I mean, why, why can one separate and the other one not? So in the PCA, I've actually done that with students this morning, uh, uh, yesterday morning. In the PCA, you do a um, you do a correlation matrix. So you you multiply your mean center data matrix with its transpose, and then you calculate eigenvalues. And the eigenvalues mm -hmm. are your principal components. And you take the largest eigenvalues, you plot them against each other, and these are principal components. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in the PLSDA, um, you tell it's a more complex algorithm that was actually developed in collaboration with Nicholson. Um, you tell the algorithm up front which is which class. Yeah. Um, and then you do a statistical analysis afterwards where you take part of the samples out to be predicted and part of them to build the model. And then you do a permutation of those that you use for model building and that, that you predict. Yeah? And from this, you get a statistic where you can predict sensitivity and specificity um, of this model. And when this and this is called the area under the receiver operator curve. And when this is about 80%, it's a solid, um, um, it's seen as a solid differentiation for medical purposes. Actually, some things, some of the medically used ones are only 70%. And we are way in the 90% between cardiogenic shock and- So probably you have a training set and then you somehow- or Yeah, you, you see, you have, you have a training set and you have a- um, a predicted set, yeah? Now you mix those, yeah? You mm -hmm. take a different part for training and a different part to be predicted. So that mm -hmm. every sample is once predicted and is once used for training, yeah? From this, you can do additional statistics to figure out how solid your data is. Okay. Yeah, that's how it, how PLSDA works. 